I don't need a big dumb Assassin's Creed style arrow telling me where to go, who to talk to, and why I should care. Yeah. I bought Assassin's Creed Mirage. Okay, but in my defense, everyone was saying that this game returns to the series roots. Stealth, parkour, and patience. Brought to us by Basim. None of this role-playing, open-world combat nonsense. What do I look like, God of War? That's what I wanted, that's what I got. Which honestly is kind of nuts, because Ubisoft's Assassin's Creed Mirage is genuinely awesome. See, if you haven't been paying attention, Assassin's Creed basically became the marvel of the video game industry in more ways than one, with Assassin's Creed Mirage even being the conclusion to their phase two. They're also starting to mirror Marvel in terms of monetary success and games mixing stories. In my Spider-Man video, I mentioned that gaming is often exempt from franchise fatigue, but video games do have franchises and they make Everything from Pokemon to Metal Gear and everything in between have peaks and valleys, or in some cases require complete reinvention or re incarnation. Hell, the only reason Assassin's Creed exists is because Ubisoft wanted to take the gameplay from Prince Persia and send it into the open world. Sub out a noble prince for a historically comparable region, then make it more about... <laughs> But the series' reputation has become quite polarized with a shift to a role-playing focus and Marvel-style yearly releases. However, Mirage brings it back to basics. Sort I'm of. honestly kind of shocked to find myself enjoying this game after watching this franchise from afar for so long change for what I thought was the worst. But Mirage is kind of great, and it makes me feel old, but I'm happy to be back in this series. And still, I have one really big problem. Hey, what's that? Why is it haunting me? Oh god, it's the story. No, please use the animus. Make me forget. Now stand back, I gotta practice my stabbing! Before we continue, I just want to give a quick shout out to all the people who have subscribed to me already. I really appreciate you all for helping me get started and giving me the encouragement to keep doing this even when the numbers are low. And if you're not subscribed and you're enjoying this video or you've seen any of my other stuff and you liked it, please subscribe. Uh, I plan on continuing this and streaming even soon. Okay, let's talk about ACDC. <laughs> Now, I really like ACDC, but a lot of their songs do sound the same, even to someone who doesn't know music. I've come to describe a lot of bands that have a lot of samey sounding songs as suffering from ACDC syndrome. It's not necessarily a bad thing, it just means you're getting the same thing over and over, even if that one thing is kick-ass. Assassin's Creed, COVID excused, basically pumps out a mainline game every year, and they have done so for 16 years. It's going to be impossible for them to replicate those first two albums in terms of their uniqueness and success, so you have to hope that every game basically brings a different idea that is very marketable to the table. Ubisoft's Assassin's Creed has always been characterized by its specific gameplay mechanics, and every game kind of feels a little bit like are a very particular set of skills. I will find you, and I will kill you. The series was always originally intended, as kind of stated before, to take those ideas from Prince of Persia and put them into an open world. But whereas Assassin's Creed is always focused on the stabby stabby, Prince of Persia was a little bit more on Mario style platforming and your ability to turn back time. As Creed took ACDC Syndrome to the max and pumped out the same kick-ass song a million times. Each game, at its core, is about planning routes to high-profile targets of members of the Order of the Ancients, or the Templars, and giving them the old to the neck, typically followed by an awkward cutscene where you talk to their corpses or have a wacky flashback because this story is Kingdom Hearts level of nutso. Each game has its own unique quirk like being able to build your own home base, explore the high seas, command a small army, or even spend too much money on downloadable cosmetics. But at the end of the day, it's about being an assassin, and Mirage does focus on that aspect more succinctly than several of its more recent counterparts do. Whereas games like Odyssey, Origins, and Valhalla lean more into open world exploration and big sprawling landscapes, Mirage brings the focus back to a small region in the form of 9th century Baghdad, which is highly comparable to Jerusalem, Rome, and even London in terms of its ability for parkour and blending in with the crowd. In an interview with Game Informer, World and Quest designer Simon Arsenion talked about how the setting itself dictates the focus, with a denser population and city requiring the focus on how you get around. In Mirage, when you leave the city to go out into the desert for a mission at a mine or a small village, you get that fantastic change of pace, and you feel like those opportunities for large-scale combat are earned, and they actually make sense in those environments. Basim can basically climb anywhere in the city on every building, except in restricted areas where you're doing the assassinations. And even in those restricted areas, you do still get some freedom of where you can go around. It's sometimes linear, but you always have options, whether that be eavesdropping in on conversations to find new entrances, whatever you want to do, bribing guards, it doesn't matter. Though I will say that Enkidu the Bird Companion is just 
kind of dumb and I know they probably just threw him in because they needed to pad out the game and make it fit with the lore and what the hell. Bird up. <laughs> Throwing knives, blow darts, smoke bombs, noisemakers, and traps. These are all items the game gives you that ostensibly an assassin would have so that they don't cause a big ruckus when they go to do an assassination, suddenly turning anywhere you try to go into with them calling all of the guards and it's basically <laughs> There's also, in terms of gameplay mechanics, the classic eagle vision, which allows you to kind of see through enemies and walls. I don't need it. Collapsible structures for you to prevent bad guys from chasing you. I don't need it. Tokens to bribe factions into helping you. I don't need it. And that aforementioned bird. Definitely don't need it. And then, as much as I didn't want to use it in-game, Basim has this ability called Assassin's Focus, where when you click R3, you basically can choose anywhere between three and five enemies, and it depends on how you level it up, and you instantaneously assassinate them in succession. And the justification is because Basim is technically not human, I guess? Uh, excuse me, what? Oftentimes you get deep into an enemy base for an assassination, and you're just thinking, come on, don't use it, you can do it, you can do it, you don't need it! I need it! <laughs> We also have a stuffy pit of collectibles for our treasure trove to retrieve. Upgrades for tools, equipment, currencies. But because of the smaller scale, everything you collect through side missions or contracts are restricted to upgrading your primary toolkit. If you don't want to 100% the game, that's just fine because acquiring all of these swords, knives, outfits, they only have minor effects on the overall experience. And that's the way it should be. I beat this game in 14 hours, 40 minutes, while still unlocking most of the skills, gathering a good chunk of the unlockables, and completing a handful of side missions. A 100% clear rate in under 24 hours is very doable, even in a casual run. So from a gameplay perspective, I really couldn't recommend this game enough, even if it is a little on the lighter side of content. But uh, Remember this guy? We gotta talk about that for a little bit. Let's imagine that it's the year 2012. Barack Thanks, Obama is busy raising up America. Carly Rae Jepsen is wondering if I'll maybe call her? And the San Francisco Giants just won two of their three World Series within five years after 60 years of sucking. At that time, you might have actually been playing the first three Assassin's Creed games right after you came home from the movies and saw The Avengers. If you liked both of those, you probably liked Altair, Ezio, and Hatham just as much as you liked guys like Captain America, Iron Man, Thor, even Hulk. Okay, now imagine you're me and you just got into college and maybe you don't have as much time for video games or movies as you used to because you're focusing on your studies. So you miss that new Ant-Man movie because, I mean, you don't know Ant-Man, you don't care. Then maybe you get into a relationship or you get a job where you have to drive like two hours every day just to get where you're going and you think, you know what, I can miss Doctor Strange or I can miss Captain Marvel, not a big deal, right? But now it's 2022 and you think, hey, you know what, I'm in a little bit more of a stable place, I've got some income, I'm gonna go see a movie. It's been a good decade, right? So you think you're gonna go see Thor Love and Thunder and have a great time because you remember Thor and it was just a wonderful experience the first few movies, right? But then you get into the movie and you start thinking, wait, why are the Guardians of the Galaxy here? Hey, when did Thor get so dang goofy? Oh my gosh, wait, what in Asgard is happening here? Wait, who's Valkyrie? Who is this silly rock man? And that is exactly what playing Assassin's Creed Mirage is like in 2023 if you've missed playing the last few games. Mirage follows the tale of Vasim ibn Ishaq. I'm not saying that right. A young man growing up during the height of the Islamic Golden Age in 9th century Baghdad. I could go in depth on his character, but I don't think that's necessary because it's literally just gotta eat to live, gotta still to eat, tell you all about it when I got the time. I'd call this comparison hilarious and forced if it weren't for the fact that Aladdin was actually set in Baghdad before they were forced to change it due to the Gulf Wars. The tutorial of this game literally has you stealing money to afford food. So as for the rest of the story, it's pretty stripped down and bare bones. Like other Assassin's Creed games, the real story is happening in the year 2020, and we're looking into someone's past life. Basim is a dashing young man who's seeing weird visions of this freaky guy, remember him like a few minutes ago? And after wanting to desperately prove himself to the Hidden Ones, or the Assassin's Order, he accidentally winds up killing the Caliph while robbing the palace of a strange artifact alongside his friend Nihal, and is forced to flee the city and join the Order of Assassins out of sheer happenstance. Fast forward five-ish years, and Basim is now an officially licensed assassin, and is sent back along with his mentor Roshan to take out the five members of the Order of the Ancients who have infiltrated and overtaken Baghdad. In the process, Basim can rid the city of those that caused him pain growing up, hopefully discover more about his visions and the object he found in the palace, and liberate the people of Baghdad from tyranny.
This part of the story is not complicated, but it's also not terribly interesting either. While I love running around the city of Baghdad here, I found that a lot of the characters and stories are kind of bland or uninteresting, despite the fact that the city itself is quite beautiful and there's a lot of wonderful historical landmarks for you to visit and interact with. Some of the characters like Dervish, Kong, and especially Mikira are really compelling and interesting, and I would have liked to spend a little bit more time with characters like that if they had more to do with Basim's story. But on the whole, the game feels like it's glossing over some of these characters and locations in service of the overall narrative of Assassin's Creed games. And that's what we gotta focus on now because oh my god. If you wanna avoid spoilers, please, this is the time to go ahead and skip to this time code because I'm gonna be spoiling, I guess what you'd call the main point of this game and a lot of the other points of Assassin's Creed games like the overall narrative. So if you really wanna hide it, go ahead and skip to this time code. All good? Did you click off? Did you go to the next time code? Uh, okay, cool, because, oh my God, he's literally Loki. Like, okay, I know I missed a few games and I know they were taking place in Greece and the North respectively. So naturally the mention of these gods is a focal point. Okay, look, here's the cliff notes. In 2012, there was a guy named Desmond who kept reliving the lives of his assassin ancestors and discovered that there are two groups fighting for control over the world. Both of these groups have been fully aware for thousands of years that there was an ancient civilization of humanoids that existed tens of thousands of years before humanity known as the Isu that created humanity as slaves. And basically all myths of gods from the Bible to the Greeks and the Norse, all of those myths are real. But a Ragnarok destroyed the Isu. Don't worry, it was just a solar flare. Those are real. Don't worry. And now in the modern day, another solar flare is about to wipe out humanity in 2012. Don't worry, it didn't. That movie sucked anyway. But now, humanity is left to deal with the fact that these Isu deities survived in their own Google Cloud tree thing, and they're looking to come back. And hey, one of them was the actual Loki. He wasn't supposed to be there because Odin grounded him. But you know how rambunctious that little guy is from Marvel and God of War. And oh my God, can we stop talking about Loki in popular culture? Nope because Loki survived and was reincarnated within our boy here. And now Basim is basically living Fight Club because Nahal was never really there. Oh my God. And it turns out that it was Loki all along, but after AC Mirage and AC Valhalla, he basically got stuck in the gray cloud server thing and now he's in the real world. And the only reason we're playing Mirage is because he swapped with Layla and now this little shit is stopping us from saving the world because he's too busy with his revenge quest. Now we don't have time to unpack all of that. Okay, so obviously that was crazy, and it does raise a difficult question in this modern era of storytelling, where these franchises basically ask you to onboard with their material from the beginning of their franchise. By itself, let's just evaluate it like this. Mirage's gameplay is pretty dang good, if at least a bit simple, and its characters are kind of bland and uninteresting. So you might think it's a standalone game, right? But this game is imperative, and you have to play it to understand the full Assassin's Creed canon and get the backstory and pivotal information on what I'd basically call the main anti hero maybe he's an anti-hero i don't know but the main one of the main characters of this entire series so does that make this game good by itself and can you play it if there's really this much required reading beforehand you might think the answer is no but honestly this game was really good and it kind of proved an interesting point to me on the state of storytelling in video games that is kind of what the main thing i took away from this game was let me explain If I were to ask you if Doctor Strange and the Multiverse of Madness was a good movie by itself, you'd probably say, not really, it was entertaining or whatever. But if I asked you if it was important to the Marvel canon, you'd probably say, oh hells yeah, it has some crazy implications. And you could say the same thing about Star Wars, Lord of the Rings, Batman, James Bond, Star Trek, whatever. All of these things demand a certain level of fervorous devotion to have the full picture, depending on how involved they get with their lore. However, I think video games sort of get to escape this because I just played Mirage without knowing any of that craziness and I still had a good time. Maybe I wish the game was 40 bucks instead of 50. Maybe I wish the parkour mechanics were a little more fine tuned and I could stop questioning whether to hit X or O to jump or drop off a building. And yeah, maybe I wish there was more of a focus on building characters in this time or place than trying to connect to an overall narrative. While there are articles upon articles discussing the declining state of Marvel films, the most critical thing you're gonna hear about Assassin's Creed is just that fans prefer certain gameplay elements over others or think specific stories and games are better. The lowest rated ones of the bunch, Unity and Rogue, came out within the same year of each other, and they're still rated a 72 overall. Other than them, virtually every other mainline game in the series, and there's 11 more of them, have at least a 75 or more on Metacritic, and most of them are in the 80s. Yeah, the games may not be masterpieces, but at least they're consistent. I guess what I'm really trying to say is that I walked away from Assassin's Creed about 10 years ago because I was getting frustrated with the shift in gameplay to more of a role-playing model in a series that I didn't really think suited it. And in the same way, I also walked away from Marvel after Avengers Endgame because the production on the movies and the writing overall was becoming so bad. Because now, if I want to jump back into Marvel, 
I have to basically go back and watch five years worth of material if I want to start watching Loki, like not even season two, but just season one, because there's so many plot points and characters and little Easter eggs that I'm going to miss because I wasn't there for all of that. But luckily, Mirage doesn't have this problem, and I don't think a whole lot of video game franchises do. Because here's the thing, this game was good all enough by itself that it actually made me care about this Loki story and made me want to go back and try some of those games like Valhalla and Odyssey and Origins because they're open world role playing games. I'm realizing now that the style change and the mechanics for gameplay being in an open world role play suited that story better. Because the story necessitated the change in genre, maybe I can approach it that way and understand it a little bit better so that way there's certain stories that are better for the parkour stealth and some that are better for open world role playing. Now I might have my preference, as all people do, but that's really interesting to me and it makes me want to go play those games. Mirage, by itself, is good. And in the greater context of Assassin's Creed, it's still good and it proves a point about video games because unlike film, whatever, they can adapt, overcome, and even totally change their genre if it suits the mechanics to give you a memorable experience. Congrats, Loki. You pulled your greatest trick of all, making an old fart like me actually give a damn about you as a character. And Ubisoft, uh, sorry for constantly ragging on you. That was my bad. All right, uh, once again, this video wound up being way too long, so let's make this quick. Thank you for watching. Go play Assassin's Creed Mirage. If you think it's good, then maybe you'll have the same reaction I did and actually want to go play all the other games. Anyways, uh, subscribe, like, comment and share 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 with your friends join the discord uh i'm gonna try streaming real real soon okay i gotta go bye i can take a hint gotta face the facts just end the video now ah!